Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Kintileva, and I'm a senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Wolverhampton. I'm so pleased to welcome you all at our first public lecture on international politics. These lectures are organized by the School of Social Science and Humanities at the University of Wolverhampton. Our programs in politics and international relations specifically create a particular uh, practical discussion-based tutorial environment to study the complexities of uh, contemporary politics and international relations through theories and case studies. Our students explore major issues affecting the world, examining the factors behind international conflicts and learn about the role of uh, state leaders, NGOs, civil society, and activists in solving major global problems. Overall, studying politics and international relations at Wolverhampton offers students diverse opportunities to engage with wide range of current concerns facing the international community. And today's lecture on China-Russia relations in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is one of such opportunities. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Marcin Kroszmarski. Dr. Kroszmarski is a lecturer in security studies and the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Glasgow. In his research, Marcin focuses on Russia-China relations, Russia's foreign policy, great power, regionalism, and the role of domestic politics in foreign policy. He's the author of the 2015 book titled Russia-China Relations in the Post-Crisis International Order, published articles in leading academic journals and collaborated with different research teams in Taiwan, Japan, Finland, the United States, and China. Martin, thank you so much for joining us today again. And please send your questions to the chat. We made sure that we leave enough room for discussion, so there will be time for it. And Martin, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'm glad to be privileged to, to be the first uh, to deliver the, the public lectures at, at, um, uh, at Wolverhampton in, in this uh, um, area. So uh, I will uh, try to uh, deliver my lecture in between 35 and 40 minutes so that we have enough time for, for the discussion and for uh, addressing uh, issues of China-Russian relations in the Q&A session. The, the very relationship is, is a phenomenon in, in international politics because China-Russian relations are the case of a rapprochement and growing, increasing cooperation for more than three decades. If we trace back the origins of the rapprochement to in the late 1980s and Mikhail Gorbachev in, in the Soviet Union, it's even, it's even a longer process. Mm. And for, for last year, in February 2022, uh, on the, exactly on the 4th of February 2022, during um, Vladimir Putin's visit to Beijing, uh, we seemed to witness, uh, we seem to have witnessed the peak of the relationship, because both sides in their joint declaration announced that there are no limits to their, to their relationship. Putin's visit was the first in-person meeting after three years because of the COVID pandemic. Mm. So it, it looked as if there are no issues which Russia and China would uh, not agree on. It seemed that both sides are willing to offer each other's um, each other full support uh, in any international in the area of international politics but very quickly after this uh, after this visit Russia invaded Ukraine and we don't know what Putin told she during this visit we may speculate uh, whether some hints were made by by, by the Russian delegation whether, the Chinese side expected this, this move, at least in some form. But what we have observed for the last year is that this is certainly a partnership or a relationship with, with limitations. And, and I will try to address those limitations and I will try to explain why there, there those limitations persist. When we when we look at the debate about and at the, at the debates about um, China Russian relations, we can distinguish between several main currents, several main ideas or representations of 
what the relationship is actually actually about. Firstly, we have the official narratives, which which are very interesting to to follow because they also evolve. Mm, and uh, whereas for most of those three decades, um, uh, beginning uh, in the early 1990s, um, Russia and China uh, used this phrase strategic partnership when it arrived in the mid 1990s. And they claimed, or they repeated that the relationship is not directed against any, any third party, that it is not an alliance. And some observers um, and many Russian and, uh, and Chinese uh, scholars or scholars based in, in Russia and China accepted this, this narrative and agreed with, uh, with uh, this description that this is a strategic partnership as a specific form of, of alignment. But recently, for the last say, probably two, three years, we have also seen the change in the discourse of Russia and China, the official um, presentation of, of the relationship. Now we hear and we read in the joint um, communications that this is a relationship which is much more advanced than, uh, than a typical alliance, or as both sides term it, a Cold War type alliance, and that this is, it is a higher form, if I may put it so, of um, alignment in international in international politics. So th there is this is the first current. So this on, ongoing official presentation of 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 the relationship. Then there is a, a current which used to be the strongest in the late nineteen nineties, in the two thousands. It was still quite strong in the, I would say, in the early 2010s, which we may summarize as the axis of convenience. So using this, this uh, excellent phrase coined by, by Bobolo in his 2008 study of the relationship. And this narrative or this, this representation of the relationship puts doubt on or expresses doubt about the genuinity, genuine character of the relationship, it uh, argues that, uh, or its proponents argue that the relationship is pragmatic, which is more or less positive, but uh, some would say that it is opportunistic, that it is the relationship which is not based on any fundamental values, that it is not uh, the relationship which would be based on shared agreement about how international politics should look like, that it is mostly driven by mm, domestic and international needs of the moment. So this is usually related to uh, the willingness of both sides to counter the US. And as a, as a consequence, um, those who mm, support the, the, the disinterpretation of, of Russian general relations as an excess of convenience argue that both sides are ready to drop the partner and to, if they receive a better offer from the US or from the West in general or from any other international partner, they will just, put it, putting it a bit colloquially, they will just uh, leave the partner and, and exit the relationship. And finally, but I would argue, and I, I will also try to show it later and we can return to this in the discussion. I would argue that this um, interpretation had its heyday in, in the 2010s or early 2010s or even late 2000s. And for the last decade, uh, we have seen a growing relevance of the third narrative of, or, or the third representation of the China Russian relationship, which may be summed up as an alliance in all but name, where the observers who or the proponents of this interpretation argue that. China Russian relationship, the China Russian relationship represents a typical alliance. It has certain drawbacks or deficiencies. It does not have the, the close to the close to support each other in uh, during the conflict, but in a number, in a growing number of areas, those states are driven either by um, power political reasons, as, as realists argue, or they are uh, driven by uh, shared norms, shared um, identities, uh, shared beliefs, as con constructivists argue, and that the relationship is stronger and stronger, and 
it's more and more substantial. That it is the relationship which is um, which we should treat as an alliance, even if you know, both states um, deny that that it is an, an alliance. I would like to to go beyond this um, this uh, these three narratives. So I would like to show that uh, the relationship is a, is a complex relationship. That we have areas in which it really acts as an alliance. That we have areas in which it acts much more as an axis of convenience. And that there are areas in which it is more or less. Um, um, identical with what both both um, uh, Moscow and Beijing want uh, us to uh, want to persuade us. So in this sense, I will I will try to approach um, the relationship as a complex relationship, one in which different issue areas are governed, if we may put it so, by different um, drivers, by different incentives. And the pace, as a, as a consequence, the pace of cooperation in different areas varies. And in some areas, it is much more advanced. In some areas, there is not much of the relationship at all. And um, the, the example <clears throat> to which we can return later of this uh, latter of the latter is um, China, China's and Russia's presence in such regions as the Balkans or Latin America. In those cases, mostly Russia and China engage in parallel activities. They don't coordinate much. Their activities, we cannot say that they are balancing in the US or the West in, in particular regions. Rather, they are using their best uh, cards or their best instruments to promote their particular interests. So how to, uh, how to reconstruct this, this relationship? And um, following on from this reconstruction, then I will move on to, to the implications of the war in Ukraine and what, what the last the, the first war of the first year of the war tells us about the relationship and how how it has impacted the, the, the relationship. So firstly let's start with, with, with the political dimension and, and the, the political convergence that we that we have seen. This is probably uh, an, uh, an area in which the relationship has gone quite a not perhaps full cycle, but um, the changes have been far reaching. If we go back uh, to the early 1990s, politically, Russia and China, or the new Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China stood at the opposite ends of political ideological spectrum, with uh, Russia embracing democracy, Yeltsin's team embracing anti communism, and the um, attempts to build the market economy in a liberal um, form. On the other hand, China, which was under the, the, the Tiananmen um, Square massacre, the Chinese authorities, which, which were uncertain of, of their future in international politics. And the, there was genuine fear of, uh, of uh, being on the wrong side of history and, and uh, being threatened by this anti-communist wave, which was uh, going through the, through the world. But these differences have uh, turned out to be rather short-lived. And so on the one hand, already in the 1990s, mm -hmm. both sides have managed to, uh, managed to minimize the differences. And even more importantly, the political systems of began to, to converge um, as mostly because of uh, the, the shift in, um, in, the, in, in the Russian domestic politics. But uh, there were, uh, when we speak, so, so when we look at the at political convergence and um, how uh, Russia and China are close to each other politically today, it was, um, it has been a, a long travel in which um, I would say that there were three main drivers or three main um, uh, factors which brought uh, Moscow and Beijing uh, increasingly closer together. And firstly, it was, it was the US. It was the US in terms of the US power, the US policies, the very existence of the US as a, as a unipole, as a only superpower. It drove uh, Russia and China closer together. But at the same time, to say that it is the US that is, has been playing this, this crucial role is not to say much about the relationship, because in this sense, the US is a constant element of this relationship. 
it was in 2000, in the year 2000, Kenneth Waltz in, in his article you know, spoke about Russia being pushed towards China because of you know, the US support for NATO enlargement or NATO expansion as, as, as Waltz put it. Uh, in the during the, the the almost any U.S. presidency, there were issues that or aspects of the U.S. policy which brought uh, Russia and China closer together. Be it uh, the Iraq War in 2003, be it missile defense, uh, or or any other. So in this sense, while I would see the U.S. as as a necessary element and an element of explaining the dynamics of China-Russian relations, which we cannot ignore and which we always have to take into consideration. At the same time, it cannot tell us why this relationship has evolved at a certain pace, why it has uh, developed to a certain stage, or why it has uh, approached certain limits. Increasingly over time, I would, I would argue that uh, the liberal international order or the arrangements of the liberal international order have been bringing both states closer together. This, the dissatisfaction of uh, Russian and Chinese ruling elites with, with, with this order was something that, that they shared in common. So they, perhaps they, um, yeah, and we can once again, we can discuss it later. I would see them as not necessarily agreeing on what should replace the liberal international order, but they, knew exactly what they didn't like about it, what they still don't like about it. And then um, we can look at the issues of democracy, pro democracy promotion, we can look at the issues of human rights. All these factors would put um, um, Russia and China closer together. And finally, when we speak about this political dimension, it is the issue of the growing similarity in their worldviews, in, in these elites, in the ruling elites' mindsets and the way in which they see the relationship between domestic and international. Uh, we can ascribe this to uh, the wave of the so-called color revolutions in, in, in the years, in 2000s, in the post-Soviet space, in the, to in the Arab Spring. But we, we, we see, we have observed over time that <clears throat> more and more often, um, the Russian and Chinese elites uh, regarded any popular movements, any popular protests as driven by the West, as steered by the West in, 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 in a more extreme version. Mm, the most recent example would be a protest in Hong Kong, which China, the Chinese <clears throat> leadership interpreted as, as, as a Western driven color revolution or uh, color revolution and official pronouncements of the Russian Federation or, or representatives who agreed with, with such with such a point. So in this sense, mm, to the factor of the US, uh, the, or the factor of the US was joined by, by other factors like this dissatisfaction with the liberal order and the growing, mm, even uh, this concern up to the point of sometimes paranoia about possible Western interference. If we look, so this is one, one area in which uh, there is really a um, <clears throat> growing and deepening um, uh, convergence between Russia and China. And, <clears throat> and the second area to which I would like to draw your attention is the security and defense um, uh, area, uh, the security and defense realm. Here we, we have always seen, uh, or we have seen two major pillars of this of this um, uh, cooperation in, in, in security and defense realm. So firstly, it was arms trade and arms sales from Russia to China. Secondly, these were joint exercises. And again, the peak of, <clears throat> uh, sorry, interestingly, the peak of uh, arms trade was in the, 19, in the 1990s when, and early in the early 2000s when China literally saved the Russian military industrial complex when um, the newly established Russian Federation could not afford to, to maintain such a such a um, uh, such an inheritance from the Soviet Union. Over time, there were some problems, and the, the most um, 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 the strongest um, this 
divergence of, of interest between Russia and China um, took place in, in the mid-2000s when um, Russia has realized, realized that the Russian elite realized this scale of reverse engineering uh, conducted by China when China reneged those in certain contracts because it, it was able to, because it has already it was already successful at uh, reverse engineering certain certain um, uh, weapons uh, weapon systems. Since then, we we have never seen arms trade to reach the levels of the either late 1990s or the early 2000s. Mm. The Russian Federation um, provided um, servicing, provided China with spare parts, but it was only after the, the annexation of Crimea and uh, when Russia had to provide more concessions to China in return for, for its support when, when Moscow agreed to once again sell to China its most advanced uh, weapon systems, um, so S-400 uh, missile systems and um, Super-35 uh, jets. But interestingly, it was these two transactions um, were concluded in 2014 and 2015. So it's going to be soon, it's going to be over a decade without major arms deals between Russia and China. So in, in a sense, the arms trade is moving a bit more towards the background of the of the, uh, the relationship in the in the security and defense. There is also a new pattern emerging. So Russia has um, begun purchasing um, certain equipment from China, and it was the case already before before they they were in Ukraine. At this stage, we don't know whether China provides any uh, any um, weapons to to Russia or arms components, but. Were it not for the for the uh, for the war, we would most probably see China increasing its export to to Russia because of uh, the advancements made by the Chinese military industrial complex. Because um, Russia has not mastered certain technologies, like for instance drones. Um, at the same time, China still seems to need uh, certain types of equipment from Russia, or at least certain parts and. One of the difficulties China faces are our jet engines. The other pillar, um, joint exercises, has been developing since the mid-2000s. And its most recent um, um, exemplifications are exercises conducted in uh, around Japan and, and uh, South Korea. So this is the area where I would say that these exercises provide us with, with most insight into the relationship. Um, and here I mean the annual um, bomber patrols around Japan and, and South Korea conducted uh, since 2019. Uh, both sides also um, organized the first uh, joint naval patrol uh, around, once again, around the, the islands of, of Japan. So this for me is the case when, uh, which signals that there is a deepening asymmetry between, between Russia and China, because Russia clearly supports China in, in China's um, political military brinkmanship in, in, in East Asia. Um, given what we know about Russia's policy towards Japan, I'm not particularly convinced that uh, such exercises benefit Russia as well. I would see them as mostly benefiting China. And China does not reciprocate. We haven't seen, apart with, with one exception, which, which was never repeated again. So with, with the exception of um, naval exercises in 2017 in the Baltic Sea, we have not seen Chinese troops conducting joint exercises in the European part of Russia or uh, actively participating in, in Russian um, exercises, which are directed um, more towards the European, um, European theater. And China had such an opportunity because in 2021, when Russia organized the, the exercises, strategic exercises codenamed Zapad 21, it would be completely natural for the Chinese troops to participate because China and also other countries participated in uh, previous editions of strategic exercises since 2018. But instead, China invited Russian troops to 
hold joint exercises in China, thus avoiding this uh, potential uh, problems in relations with, with European states, but also it also demonstrates this asymmetry. So Russia supporting China in East Asia, China not necessarily supporting Russia in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Finally, the, the, the third um, area of, of the relationship to which I would like to um, devote some, uh, some time is the energy cooperation. And it's um, one of, uh, I would argue, most um, interesting to follow areas of, of Sino-Russian cooperation. Um, and the, 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 for me, this is the case of what I would term fragmented cooperation. So cooperation, which is partly driven by strategic considerations, but partly driven by the interests of domestic players, either individuals at the helm of, of um, uh, major uh, companies or those companies uh, themselves. And we also have seen in the, in the, in the energy sphere we, we can very closely follow how different sectors evolve and how cooperation in different sectors evolves and develops at a, at a different pace. For instance, the oil sector is an absolute success story. So of course, there are issues which, 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 uh, which, are, which, have, which were obstacles to this relationship and there are uh, failures of the relationship, but when, com when we compare it to other areas, um, Cooperation in the oil sector has flourished well before 2014, before the annexation of Crimea. All major pipelines, contracts were uh, concluded um, mostly between 2008, 2009, so the global economic crisis time and, and before, before the annexation of Crimea. On the other, the, the, the other uh, sector, if we look at the gas sector, we need to split it into the LNG sector where the leader in, in the Russian market is the company Novatec and the um, pipeline gas area in which um, it is Gazprom, which, which still holds the monopoly for export. And in the, the case of the LNG sector, or it, when it comes to the gas um, um, cooperation in general, both sides spent a decade over futile negotiations. Um, their needs were mismatched, they could not find a compromise. And what's for me the most interesting case is that China used uh, internal in fighting the Russian political economy uh, to advance its case. So rather than um, exhausted with, uh, with the lack of results in um, talks with Gazprom, Chinese, uh, the Chinese side turned to Novatec, offered support, offered uh, loans. It was accepted as um, as a shareholder in, in Novatex projects. So in this sense, China has managed to use the clashes within the Russian energy sector to, to advance its case. Finally, the, the, the Gazprom, uh, the, the case of Gazprom which, and, and the gas sector, which uh, I have the impression that is most attractive politically because or, or media, uh, in, in the media because of these huge sums. So the, the, the contract which was on the US 400 billion signed in Shanghai in 2014, right after the annexation of Crimea, it captures the imagination. But at the same time, the, although the power of Siberia gas pipeline is working and uh, it's still not operating at the full capacity, and even if it is one day, probably in 20, around 2025, it is still providing China with less gas, natural gas, than uh, Central, uh, Central Asia China. Uh, gas pipeline. So in this sense, whereas in the oil sector, Russia is a key supplier competing for the first uh, place with, with Saudi Arabia when it comes to supplying China. In, in the case of, of, of uh, pipeline gas, the situation is it's much, more, much more complex. And as we can return to the issue of what happens as a result of, war, of the war in Ukraine, uh, I will argue that this is um, uh, an area which is still troubled by, by the lack of a compromise and by, uh, once again, mismatched expectations of, of, both, of both sides. So to, to look a bit more closely, what, what, what 
what has the war in Ukraine changed in the, in the Sino-Russian relationship? Uh, perhaps just uh, before before we we do it, um, just one one more uh, one more comment of qualification. The Sino-Russian relationship has has really grown in substance. So we could spend much more time um, discussing other areas. So firstly, we we, ha we have only mentioned uh, energy, but we could spend much more time discussing the economic relationship in general. So the patterns of trade, the patterns of investment. What happens with the Russian Far East and how China's place in the Russian Far East has evolved? We haven't um, discussed the uh, cooperation in the regional dimension. So, firstly, Central Asia is, is one of the most interesting cases, but also the Arctic. Finally, the regions which which are which we may term third regions, so the regions which in which neither um, uh, in which both Russia and China are extra regional powers. Finally, we, we, we haven't discussed the, the, the global dimension and how uh, Russia and China um, operate uh, in a particular areas of, of global governance. But this is, this is something which, which is, I would argue, different about this relationship when we compare it to 10 or 15 years ago. That now we can see much more, many more interactions between Russia and China. We see that their relationship is gradually embracing new and new areas. So in this sense, we have, for, for sure, we have seen the development of, of relationship and it is much more substantial than it was in, in for instance, 2008 when, when this uh, phrase of the exit from Venus was, was coined. But to look at the implications of, of, of the war in Ukraine, so we, we, we've, well, certainly we should, we should start with, with the observation that Probably as, as many other uh, observers, um, the Chinese sides, the, the Chinese elites were surprised by Russia's failure in Ukraine uh, or by Russia's inability to achieve a quick victory. Because with all the material asymmetry which we um, see in the China Russian relationship, with um, China being an economic superpower, Russia still being a um, a, a great power in decline with these relatively few assets to capitalize on. Russia's military successes were, in my view, one factor which diminished or limited this, this asymmetry because Russia's annexation of Crimea, uh, the intervention in Syria, they sent a, a message to, to the Chinese elites that Russia is a skillful player when it comes to using military instruments. And my, my first observation would be that the failure in Ukraine and the fact that the war is, um, that Russia was unable to uh, achieve a quick victory, it, dis it, it dispelled this perhaps a myth of, of, of Russian uh, military superiority. And it makes this asymmetry to widen, widen uh, again. At the same time, uh, this was, I, I would say, the, the effect of, of the first first couple of weeks. Very quickly, um, Russia and China started adapting to, to, to a, a new situation. And we have seen, uh, we have witnessed China's support for Russia in a number of, of, of areas. So firstly, politically, uh, the Chinese official discourse mirrors uh, the Russian narratives. And when it comes to um, discussing the, the, even the very fact of the Chinese media and Chinese leadership using the terms of conflict, crisis, avoiding the word, the word war, um, uh, even in the, in the so-called peace plan or the peace initiative, uh, when reading the Chinese proposals, we, we may have the impression that it is an abstract conflict in which there are two equal parties and and China just offers um, some support. So in this sense, and blame, once again, blaming the US, uh, blaming NATO for, for, the, for, for the war, um, repeating about the, the, the Russian, um, uh, repeating um, the Russian narratives and, and the Russian um, justifications for, 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 for the so-called special military operation. So in this sense, um, 
China did what, what Russia, what the Russian leadership we may assume is, is expected from China. So it provided Russia with strong political support without any willingness. So even though positioning itself as, as a neutral party, China struggled to avoid any criticism of Russia or anything which might be interpreted as, as, as a criticism towards, towards Russia. Secondly, there is the, the economic area. In the economic area, we have witnessed uh, the growth of Sino-Russian bilateral trade, and which, which reached in 2022, uh, reached uh, the level of 185, 190 US, uh, US dollar, billion US dollars. Um, we have seen uh, the growth in um, the purchases of, of, Russian, of, of the Russian oil. But here, my, my argument would be that it is mostly the Chinese, comp Chinese companies that capitalized on uh, the situation in Russia. So Western companies left, left the market and there was vacuum, which was uh, very quickly filled uh, by, um, uh, by Chinese companies. At the same time, uh, I would argue that <clears throat> the Chinese state or the Chinese leadership has not decided to extend strategic support so to Russia. So the support which would explicitly and openly help Russia to bypass Western sanctions. And we can easily imagine such moves. China could have, uh, it could um, extend and um, provide Russia with loans. It could provide Russia with, uh, with credit lines. And ultimately the, the, the easiest thing to do would be to agree to the uh, to, to, and to sign a contract, especially during the recent visit by Xi Jinping to, to Moscow, uh, to sign the contract on the power of Siberia too. Uh, so the gas pipeline, which uh, is supposed to go to China via Mongolia, and which Russia argues that, uh, is agreed with Mongolia, and which would be a long-term commitment. It would be a signal that China is offering Russia an alternative to the West, and even if, if we realize that the pipeline would not be uh, built in, in one or two years. It would take a bit more time to uh, make it um, work, but still it would be a clear signal. That China, in the situation when Russia decides to leave the European gas market, China offers its own, its own market. It provides uh, Russia with certain support and the contract could be supported with uh, prepayments. So there would be a lot, there's a lot that China could do but it would, in each case, um, it would require China to change its position. So from this neutral position to uh, openly admit that it helps Russia to bypass Western sanctions. And this is what, what we have not, not observed, at least not yet. My explanation would be that the main reason is China's relationship with Europe. And not particularly with the, with the US, because um, I think that, uh, in my opinion, the Chinese elites recognize the rivalry with the US as a constant element of, of international politics. And they, uh, there may be um, ups and downs, but it is something which is not going away. And um, um, perhaps it's, it's even such understanding or such reasoning that whatever China would do, it is not going to be enough for the US to change its policy towards China. But the Europe is a different story because Europe is still in the process of deciding what kind of policy pursue towards China, whether to uh, jump on the US bandwagon and whether to join the US and which would end up or result in, in a joint transatlantic policy or whether to try to navigate between uh, on the one hand, the US and China's policy towards, towards Russia. And I would also see China's peace plan or China's um, uh, declarations concerning the um, non-use of nuclear weapons also is directed mostly at, at, at Europe and trying to provide those in Europe who uh, support a more reconcil reconciliatory policy towards China and more benign approach towards China and this not from the US as, as arguments which, which they can they can use in intra-European debates. At the same time um, I would argue that China would not like to see Russia completely losing the war because the, for 
the last decade or even probably I would trace it to the global economic crisis of 2010 to 2009. The dominant understanding of the West in, in, in China is that the West is declining, that the West uh, is no longer what it used to be. So from this perspective, in this sense, persistent and continuous support for Ukraine, Western unity, they very explicitly challenge this, this narrative. And if if one one day and um, the war ends and it ends with, with Russia's failure, it means that this this narrative of declining West does not um, uh, is not um, does not have much in common with with reality. So I would say that um, China seems to uh, to to to, to uh, slowly coming to, to to the conclusion. I would argue that. The war has demonstrated that the relationship is is very strong. So Russia can count on China in the sense of China is not going to stab Russia in the back, uh, to put it uh, bluntly. Uh, China, uh, Russia can rely on political support from China. The Chinese leadership uh, hasn't prevented its companies from from uh, actively uh, helping Russia uh, by entering the Russian market and why possibly even providing certain uh, dual use technologies. But at the same time, there is still this unwillingness to commit full resources. There is unwillingness to provide Russia with this kind of carte blanche support. Uh, so in this sense, what the war has demonstrated is that the partnership, the relationship, whatever uh, term we use, the alignment between Russia and China has clear limitations. And um, in this sense, the war and how the relationship evolved has evolved, evolved um, uh, for the first year of, of the war, challenged the narrative of the partnership with, with no limits, which, which both sides uh, agreed in, in February 2022. At the same time, and, and this is where I would like to, to conclude, I wouldn't see many reasons for, for Russia and China falling out because they still they still need, need each other. And, and their relationship is, while it is a complex relationship, it is a relationship which is multidimensional, uh, which is increasingly embedded in multi um, people contacts, at least at the elites level, and one which is driven by by a lot of shared ideas about international politics, about domestic politics, and how they these two should interact with each other. So, in this sense, with all the limitations, I would still expect uh, Russia and China deepen their cooperation in the coming in the coming years, at least until the current leadership in in the Kremlin, re, uh, until the current leadership remains in the Kremlin. And I would stop here. <laughs>